Bamborough is undoubtedly one of England's most magnificent castles. It's definitely one of those places where cameras just can't fully capture how impressive it is. It's built on a volcanic outcrop of rock, an incredibly good place to defend. It's got commanding views of the country on one side of it, and the sea on the other. Now this is my favourite place on earth, and in this video I'm going to be exploring the many ghost stories here. But first, a little history. Bambara has a fascinating past, and really, that needs its own video, or even series, to cover it. So this will be a brief overview. The first written reference to the castle was in the 6th century, when King Ida built a stronghold here, on the site of an older British settlement. The name Bambara most likely comes from King Ethelfrith, the grandson of King Ida. He was said to have named the fortress after his second wife, Beba. This place would become the capital of the Anglo-Saxon Kingdom of Northumbria, but would eventually be burned down by the Vikings in 993, with the Normans building a new castle on the site. For many centuries, it served as an English border stronghold, of which there were many to keep the Scots at bay. During the War of the Roses, Bamborough became the first castle in England to be taken with the support of cannons. Eventually, it was bought by the famous engineer and industrialist William Armstrong, who started a huge restoration project for the castle. And the castle remains in the Armstrong family to this day. Now this barely scratches the surface of the castle's history. I've not mentioned King Oswald or the Forster family, who are central figures to this story, but we'll have to save all that for another day. For now, let's dive into the stories of the supernatural and the unquiet souls, that still wander these castle walls. The first ghost is the Green Lady, also known as Green Jane, named after the green cloak that she wears. And she's the ghost of a girl from the village of Bambra that died sometime in the 15th century. She was poor, hungry and desperate. Her family sent her up to the castle to beg for scraps of food, so she made her way up there while carrying her baby in her arms. She pleaded with the castle guards who led her into the grounds, but for some reason never led her inside the castle to ask for the food. They taunted her and abused her, which led to her falling down some steps to her death. Some say that she collapsed at the top due to how weak she was from hunger, while others think that she was pushed. The baby she was carrying also died from the fall. Jane's ghost is seen and heard from the green within the grounds. She descends from a staircase at the top of one of the postern gates, and then falls, quickly followed by a scream. There are also sounds of a baby crying and screaming that visitors hear from this area. In response, many of these visitors over the years have rushed to the aid of this woman, having heard the scream, but are then unable to find any trace of the young lady, or her young child. While we're in this part of the castle, it might be worth pointing out that the old cannon here was long believed to be from a Spanish Armada ship. Now it turned out that it was actually from a Dutch trading vessel that was transporting cannons and was wrecked off the Farn Islands, but that's still an interesting bit of folklore. While there may not be any connection with the Armada here, there is a ghost of an Elizabethan naval gunner that's seen around by the Armstrong Museum. Who he is, or why he's here, is a mystery lost to time. Now we're going to take a look at the Norman Keep, the oldest part of the castle, with construction beginning in 1095. The sounds of clanking footsteps can be heard at night in the keep, accompanied by weary groans and rattling chains. This is said to be the ghost of a knight, but its origins are a mystery. If we speculate on who it might be, there are a number of possible suggestions. It could be a historical figure. They might have been garrisoned here, besieged here, or died here. If you go into St. Aidan's Church in the village of Bambra, you'll find there an unknown knight whose origins are lost to history. Perhaps this knight could have some connection to the knight that haunts the keep in Bambra Castle. 
Some would also speculate that it could be the ghost of Sir Lancelot, as Bambara was often considered in folklore to be Joyous Guard, the mythical fortress home of Arthur's greatest knight. I'd like to take you to the King's Hall now, a Victorian-era masterpiece and banqueting room. A piano has been heard playing by itself here, not particularly spooky when compared to some of the other things that have been reported from this area though. In 2007, there were three sightings of a tall figure wearing a black cloak. On each occasion, a member of staff followed the figure to ask where they were going but found that it just disappeared. This figure was seen once in the Cross Hall porch, but twice in the King's Hall. Now while we're in the King's Hall, we can see some large paintings of important figures from British and Northumbrian history hanging up on the wall. And this man here is Dr John Sharp, who is said to be someone else that haunts the castle. You can see him wearing the clerical robes of the Archdeacon of Northumberland. In the 18th century, Dr. Sharp helped to initiate building work on the castle, as well as repurposing the castle to provide food and care for people, a school for local children, a hospital and an early lifeboat station. Dr. Sharp also secured agreement that all wreckage thrown up on the coast near Bamborough would be brought to the castle and stored until it was claimed by its proper owners. He hired men to ride along the coast at night time during every great storm to assist anyone coming on shore from shipwrecks who would then be given food and shelter in the castle. He also paid for a signal gun to be fired regularly during every fog. He was deeply invested in this castle and the community around it and was so attached to this place, it seems, when he died, he didn't move on. Dr. Sharp is said to wander the corridors of Bamborough Castle, keeping an eye on the place that he loved so well. A pleasant reminder that not all ghosts are malicious. It's said that the ghost of a witch haunts the castle too. There is, of course, one famous witch associated with Bamborough, and that is the ghastly woman from the old legend of the Laidly Worm. In this story, a wicked lady married the King of Northumbria, who already had two children with his previous wife, who passed away. And everyone in the kingdom loved the princess more than the king's new wife. So this woman, who was secretly a witch, turned the beautiful young girl, her stepdaughter, into a hideous creature, a worm. Now at the conclusion of this story, the girl's brother defeats the witch and uses her magic against her, turning her into a hideous toad. And the toad is condemned to remain in a deep, dark well, or shaft or hole, as punishment forever. And some say that she lies at the bottom of the Anglo-Saxon well that you can find inside the keep. The top of the well is bolted up, and I believe I have an explanation that links in with the legend. I recently discovered the memoirs of a man called John Nutman, who recalls growing up in Bamborough in the 1920s. In his writing, he talks about how one of his favourite haunts as a child was what he referred to as the dungeon, with the entrance found 50 yards south of the war memorial at the front of the castle. He says you had to open a trapdoor and climb down an iron ladder and walk about 20 yards into the castle underground. And then you'd come to the wall of the well, and upwards was the faint light from the keep. John says that in the tale he was told, the owners of the castle, at some point in the past, were having a meal one day, and a head appeared over the top of the well. And so the decision was made to padlock the top. He says that the way he used to get into the bottom of the well 
that trapdoor. It's all cemented over now. So it's impossible for us to get down and have a look. Do you think that the toad might still be down there? There are stories of ghosts of children that have been seen running through the castle corridors and messing with the lights. But there's something else that lurks in Bambra's corridors that you're far more likely to encounter. The Pink Lady is Bambra Castle's most famous ghost, as well as the most commonly seen. When you reach the end of the modern section of the castle, the parts that were built in the early 1900s, you reach a corridor that leads to the Norman Keep, built in the late 1100s. The stairs are built into the thick walls of the keep, with the only original entrance being a door on the ground floor. It's this corridor and staircase that is said to be the most haunted part of the castle. This is where people report feeling a chill in the air, a feeling of being watched, and sometimes see the ghost of a woman. In Robert Hugel's 1939 book, Borderland Castles and Peels, the author discusses the Pink Lady in his section on Bambra Castle. Now this isn't a book on ghosts, it's about castle history, but he feels the Pink Lady was important enough to mention. He says that it was on the staircase leading into the keep that the ghost was seen. He writes that it was here that Lord Armstrong's former chauffeur saw the ghost of the Pink Lady, the pathetic wraith that haunts these quarters. Hearing footsteps approach, he stepped into an alcove to make way, and, happening to look down, caught a brief glimpse of buckled shoes and an old-fashioned dress. On inquiry, he found that there was no one but himself in that part of the keep at that time. Hugill also writes that the bedroom of the Pink Lady remains, and is curiously shaped and holds strange shadows, even in the daytime. I'm not sure what room this is, but it isn't open to the public, and will no doubt be one of the private apartments now. But who is the Pink Lady, and what is her origin? By all accounts, she's the oldest ghost in the castle. Now supposedly, she was a Northumbrian princess, but perhaps she was a minor figure of importance that evolved into a princess over the years in the stories. In any case, she lived in the castle under the watchful eye of her father, who disapproved of a young man that she was in love with, and so found a reason to send him overseas and away from Bambara. Possibly banishment, possibly on a doomed mission. In any case, he stopped all messengers from travelling between the two, and hoped that his daughter would just move on. But she didn't. So one day, he told her that word had reached him that her lover had married another woman, and that he was no longer in love with her. Of course, this was a lie, but he saw this as the only way to make her get on with the rest of her life. All that was keeping his daughter going was the thought that one day her true love would return to her, and now her father had informed her that he would never be coming back. The princess was plunged into a deep depression, and so the king ordered the castle seamstress to make her a beautiful new dress in her favourite colour pink. When she was gifted the dress, she put it on and then slowly walked to the castle wall. Without a second thought, she climbed the battlements and threw herself over, being dashed on the rocks below. She is still seen in the old parts of the castle to this day, as well as walking down from the castle to the beach, where she's sometimes seen standing on the sand, looking out to sea, waiting for a true love to return. It was said that her lover did eventually make it back to Bambara years later, only to find out that the princess had died tragically. I've now covered all the ghosts that are found within the castle walls, but there are many more spirits that are found outside the walls too. I'm heading down to the beach, where you can get the best views of the castle and enjoy one of Northumberland's most photographed landscapes. It's been said that centuries ago, Witch covens were living amongst the sand dunes. In some tales, 
the witches would capture anyone unlucky enough to stumble across them. Perhaps like shipwrecked sailors. And they'd burn them alive on a pyre, with the exception of their hands which they'd first remove. But there's no evidence for this, of course. I'm not sure how old this story is. But we do know that at one point in the past, the dunes were home to wreckers. Mostly just locals from the village. Now wreckers, which are perhaps most famously associated with the Cornish coast, these people waited on the shore during stormy nights in the hope that ships would be wrecked on the rocks and their cargo would wash ashore ready to be plundered. Any surviving crew from the ships were killed by the wreckers as soon as they reached the beach. They couldn't have any witnesses. Perhaps this might provide an explanation for the dark shadow people that are known to lurk in the dunes. Make sure you avoid going alone at night. Archaeologists have found over a hundred skeletons dating back 1500 years on the beach at Bamborough, with some of them coming from far off places like France and Scandinavia. It makes you wonder how many more bodies are buried here that we just don't know about. During the making of Roman Polanski's adaption of Macbeth in 1970, which was being filmed here, some of the extras were taking a break on the beach when they saw a dismembered hand crawling along the sand. They assumed it was part of the film's special effects, but it soon dawned on them that this wasn't the case. There was also a story dating back from the 1980s, I believe, where a class of school children were having a nice day out at Bambra and were holding hands as they walked along the beach. A little girl at the back turned around to see whose hand she was holding, only to be terrified when she saw a severed hand holding hers. The ghostly hand quickly vanished when she began to scream. Like I said at the start, I will most definitely return here again in order to make some videos on the history of Bambra. It's an incredible location, and I'd like to thank the present owner, Francis Watson Armstrong, for allowing people to film inside his home. There are many places too nearby to Bambra that are rich with ghost stories, such as the island of Lindisfarne, which you can see from Bambra. I'll definitely have to make a visit here soon. While there are many ghost stories attached to this castle, it's not spooky in the slightest. It's a very welcoming and peaceful place, even in the dark winter months. And it looks very impressive at night too, I must say. So stick around until the end, and I'll show you what that looks like. Before I finish though, I must say a massive thank you to my patrons and supporters who make these videos possible. The petrol, the entrance fees, and in some cases accommodation, they all help me out with these things that I need to keep these videos coming. Shout out too to my newest ones, Matthew, Dorothy and Joe, and Stefan and Erica. I'd also like to say how great it is that today I reached 12,000 subscribers, so thank you to every one of you that watches these videos and helps keep these old stories alive. <laughs>